and we'll try and make this kind of short. It doesn't need to be very long, so we can uh, save everybody a little of their life. Sure. Okay. Happy holiday. Happy holiday. You're listening to the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. While the merry bells keep ringing, may your every wish come true. And now here's your host, Rish Outfield. So, I'm sorry, why can't Secret Santa just be openly gay? And Big Anklevich. My hello is 2010. What does the word Doonstief mean? Uh, happy holidays, everyone. Happy holidays. And welcome to the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rich Outfield. Happy holidays. I was going to say that. Shoot. And this is episode 138. Of 139. (laughs) You're almost there, folks. Uh, That's one thing that I hate with MP3 files when people put like how many of how many like on the album you know what i mean when that's in the metadata you probably have no idea what i'm even talking about do you no i still use a phonograph oh yeah i hate that i would delete that out i hate when it says like seven of nine that's a star trek reference if you didn't realize i had no idea tell me more no actually don't so today we have a story it's by a returning author And it's by a returning Broken Mirror author. Please explain. Well, today is the first of our Broken Mirror Champion Stories event. Okay. (laughs) Okay, that's not what it's called. But we did way back in... When was it that we did the uh, announcement in the first place? We were calling it our 2011-2012 Broken Mirror Story event. Um, And here it is, the end of 2012, and the first one is finally airing. It's definitely going to bleed into 2013. Oh, yes, definitely. The only reason we're airing this one now is because of the subject matter. Yeah, we figured it's probably important to get it out while it's relevant. Because, you know, once the world has come to the end on the 21st, nothing will be relevant. Is it the 21st when that's going to happen? Yes. Ooh, okay. We'll be lucky if we can get this episode out before the end of the world, really. Yeah, I don't, I don't see that happening. <laughs> but anyways, yeah, today is the first Broken Mirror story. There are... Uh, so yeah, back in December of 2011, we started the Broken Mirror story contest in which uh, we invited anyone to write a story based on a premise, which we provided for them. And they had about a month and a half. We actually gave them all the way till January 12th, 2012, to write a story that went with the premise, a phone rings in the middle of the night. The voice on the line says only one word, but it is enough. We read all the stories and we picked the top four vote getters to be episodes on our show and this is going to be the first one it's not actually the fourth best story i should say it didn't get the fourth best score but it's the only christmas related story so we're going to do it first so that we can get it in in time for christmas and who wrote this story this story was written by returning broken mirror story event champion josh roseman roseman that's right yes in uh, in our original Broken Mirror Story event. Josh Roseman placed among the top finishers as well. So here he is back again. I think he thought we said this was a best two out of three type thing. So now he's won it all. (laughs) Okay. So his story is called Secret Santa. And who brought that to us today? Who produced that? This story was produced by our good friend Amory Lowe. I think this is his second story producing for us. Really? We gave him something like this for a second story? Yeah, that's right. We really trust this guy. We did, yes. This is quite a story to be giving to somebody for their second story. This falls in the novelette category, not in just the short story category on our uh, categories, I guess is what it's called on the site. I, I believe we decided we would call it the Orgasmatron. Oh. But maybe I'm remembering that wrong. 
Pitiful. I forgot we had that discussion. That's right. So anyways, yeah, Amory Lowe, he did a great job with this story. It's really fun. Not only is it super long, it involves silly voices. It involves sound effects. So get ready. I think you're in for quite a treat. I think you will enjoy it. And we'll have more for you on the flip side. Wait, wait, wait. wait. Usually we do a, about the author. Oh, True. About the author. Oh, oh, right. Sorry, I almost forgot that. Um, Josh Roseman. Oh, who is also a very talented trombonist. I've... No, no, no. It's not that Josh Roseman. This is the other one. Oh. He lives in uh, Georgia. Wait, there's a country. Co- Wait, this is a rerun. We're recording a rerun. <laughs> As a matter of fact, we are. Yeah. He had a story on our show just a few episodes ago. Just six episodes ago, he did a story, Belief. Six episodes ago, sadly, was uh, in August, but he's had several other stories on our show as well. Uh, The aforementioned Broken Mirror champion. Oh, and that one was 14 Melissa's, eight Charlene's. (laughs) Close. And 27 27 Jennifer's. Jennifer's. Well, it's cool to have him back. Yeah, it's nice to have him along. He's always been a friend. He's one of our uh, early adopters. He uh, started listening to the show back when it was terrible. So August. And yes. <laughs> and he even helped us along with a lot of comments saying, you know what? Maybe you should uh, turn the drums down. Because seriously, like several visits to the doctor has finally, you know, gotten my hearing back in order. But that helped us learn to turn the drums down. Cool. So yeah, he's he's uh, back with another Broken Mirror Story winner. Check it out, folks. Secret Santa by Josh Roseman. Prologue. Okay, Jimmy. We know you've gone through this a lot of times, but if you could just do it once more. <sighs> Jimmy sighed. The novelty and the adrenaline had worn off. And now he just wanted to go to bed and forget it ever happened. I was at home playing on my Xbox and I heard something crash. I thought it was the dog, but when I got to the living room, I saw two guys trying to steal the TV. I ran for the door, but one of them pointed a gun at me and told me to get down on the floor. And that's when the man... (sighs) Another sigh. That's when the man came out of the fireplace. What did he look like exactly? He was a big fat white guy with a beard, dressed all in black and with a mask over his eyes. Did he say anything? Uh Uh-uh. Jimmy fidgeted. (laughs) He just climbed out, swung something like a big black bag at one of the guys, and then punched the other. The TV fell on the floor. It was still there, face down. Jimmy's dad was more pissed about that than anything else. The guy with the gun shot at the fat man, but it it was like it passed right through him. The bullet we took out of the wall. I guess. Jimmy said. Anyway, he beat on the two guys until they stopped fighting, then tied them up and told me to call 911. Did he do anything else? Jimmy shrugged. He just smiled at me and went back into the fireplace. You guys got here like a minute later. And you're sure he didn't do or say anything else? Nothing. Jimmy looked at his mom, who was sitting beside him. Can I go, please? The police officer nodded. Jimmy made a quick escape to his bedroom. He hadn't told the whole truth. The man had saved Jimmy's family from being robbed. He'd also given something back. In the corner of Jimmy's room, under a pile of dirty clothes, was a small, flat package wrapped in brightly patterned paper with a bow on top. Don't open this until you're alone, the man had said as he'd pulled it from his sack. Jimmy ripped open the wrapping paper. Under it was a copy of Skyrim, the game he'd been saving his allowance for over the past month. Sweet, he said. Then he looked out the window. In the clear night sky, it seemed as though one star twinkled more brightly than the rest. 
Thanks, man, Jimmy said. Whoever you are. One. Wes had seen those reality shows about lottery winners who blew through everything in a year, and he didn't want to be that guy. He kept his job, hired a financial planner, and paid off his parents' mortgage, but otherwise didn't spend very much of his money. But winning the lawsuit, $1 million minus his lawyer's 30%, hadn't made him happy. He hadn't been in it for the money in the first place. He'd gone under the knife and had gastric bypass surgery because, after decades of diet, exercise, and medication, nothing had made him smaller. Surgery was his final option. The surgery had failed. Despite Wes's best efforts and a year of testing and research, no one could figure out why. To make matters worse, Wes still had to follow a restrictive dietary and medical regimen for the rest of his life because, despite being obese, he had the stomach of a man who'd had a successful surgery. What do you think will make you less unhappy? Wes's therapist asked one day shortly before Thanksgiving. Wes had an easy answer to that. Not being fat anymore. For the surgery to have worked. For me to get the results I paid for. But it didn't work. Yeah, and no one knows why. Wes clenched his hands on the arms of his chair. That pisses me off most of all. I'm still fat and no one can tell me why. Later that evening, in his empty apartment, Wes had sold his house after his wife had left him, claiming he was obsessed with the failed surgery and wasting all his time and their money trying to figure it out. He fixed himself a small dinner, took his medication, and sat in his easy chair with his iPad. But he couldn't read, and when he tried to go to bed, he couldn't sleep. All he did was toss and turn and stew, getting angrier and angrier about his situation until, finally, he took a few sleeping pills and passed out on the couch, where he had the most interesting dream. In it, he was on a broad, flat, snow-swept plain. The sun was high overhead, and though it was clearly cold, Wes was comfortable in a t-shirt and jeans. He crunched through the snow drawn northward like a compass needle, until he came to what felt like a massive wall of glass. He pressed his hands to it, pounded on it, kicked it, but nothing affected it. On the other side of the wall, a little person wearing all green appeared. He held up a piece of paper, flattened it against his side of the wall. Wes peered at the words. We can tell you why it didn't work. Just say yes. What? He called, cupping his hand around his mouth and pressing them to the glass. What does that mean? The little person folded up the sign, put it in his pocket, and turned around. He took three steps away and, on the fourth, disappeared. When Wes woke, he barely remembered the dream, something about snow and glass, and he was too groggy to think about it anyway. The sleeping pills always did that to him. He rolled out of bed and half stumbled to the shower, turning it as hot as he could stand, waiting for it to wash away the fog so he could start another day. 2. Wes went through the motions in the weeks leading up to Christmas. He bought gifts for his parents and his friends, attended two parties at work, and volunteered to be on call during the holiday. It's not a problem, he told his boss. I don't have anyone to get mad at me for it. She made a sympathetic face, but put his name on the schedule nonetheless. Everyone at work said the usual things. Oh, that sucks. It's so stupid. Why do we even need anyone on call during Christmas? And the ever-popular, better you than me, man. But Wes just ignored it. He did his job day in and day out, until Christmas Eve when the VP let everyone leave at noon. Wes had dinner with his cousin Renee and her family, and then went home, planning to have a drink, watch a movie, and try not to wonder what Robin was doing during their first Christmas apart in almost ten years. Wes fell asleep halfway through Die Hard, one of his favorite Christmas movies. 
but was jolted awake by his phone, which played an annoyingly jaunty tune in an attempt to get his attention. He grabbed it off the end table and slid his thumb across the screen. Th he cleared his throat. <clears> throat. This is Wes. This is Wes Howard. Well? He waited, but nothing more was forthcoming. Well, what? Silence. An open connection. Nothing more. Wes glanced at the clock on his phone screen. One minute after midnight. Look, buddy, he said. I don't know what you're asking. He trailed off, though, suddenly remembering, as if it were deja vu, a dream about snow and glass and a little man telling him to just say yes. So he did. To Wes's complete lack of surprise, nothing happened. The phone went silent. He shivered. It was cold in the apartment, but he didn't want to get up and mess with the thermostat. Instead, he just curled up more tightly under his snuggie and closed his eyes. Well? Wes shot to his feet. Right there, in his living room, next to the coat closet by his front door, was the little person he'd seen in his dream. He wore the same green outfit, breeches over tights, vest over shirt, pointed cap with bells on, and shoes with curled toes. Well, what? Well, are you coming? Wes glanced at the bottle on the end table. He'd only had a couple of shots. There wasn't enough missing for him to be seeing things. Who the hell are you? I'm here to collect you. The little man glanced at the coat closet. You really ought to clean this thing out. It smells like mothballs and wet ass. <laughs> Wes chuckled. His gym bag, long disused, hung in that closet, but he forced himself to be serious. Tell me who you are first. The man sighed. <sighs> I'm Filbert Gladness. Now would you get the hell over here? Filbert? Like the nut? Filbert rolled his eyes, then pointed at Wes. Wes felt an uncontrollable urge to walk toward the little man, he did manage the presence of mind to snatch up his phone on the way. What are you doing? What does it look like I'm doing? He waved Wes into the closet, then followed him inside. Why couldn't you have a fireplace like a normal person? It's an apartment. Wes felt his back pressed up against the shelves behind his jackets. Filbert pulled the door shut. What the hell is going on? Shut up, he said. This part's tricky without a chimney. Wes opened his mouth to protest, but when a pale green glow appeared around Filbert's hands, he decided not to make any noise. The coat closet began to spin. Wes felt it in his inner ear and reached out to brace himself. Filbert was murmuring something under his breath, and the glow was growing brighter, bright enough that Wes had to close his eyes against it. Without warning, there was a thunderclap, followed by an icy breeze blasting Wes in the face. He opened his eyes and gaped. He was on the snow-swept plain. The sun was directly overhead, and, as in his dream, Wes was comfortable in his jeans and t-shirt. Take that thing off, Filbert said. You look like an idiot. Wes removed his snuggie, rolled it up, and stuck it under his arm. Better... I guess. Filbert? The little man gave him a put-upon look. What? Where are we? Filbert didn't answer. He just started walking away. Wes had no choice but to follow. It was either that or get left behind. Three. Wes bumped into the glass wall. Filbert, for his part, seemed not to have noticed. Hello, Wes called. Filbert! The little man must have heard him through the thick glass. He pointed his hand at Wes and said something, and Wes felt a tingling all over his body. When he pressed against the glass again, he moved through it like it was water. Come on, Filbert said. Don't want to be late. Late for what? Filbert rolled his eyes. Just keep moving. 
Wes had no idea how long he'd been following the little man across the snow, but he was quite aware that his feet didn't hurt. And a man of Wes's size couldn't walk very far without that happening. Soon they came to another glass wall. This one, even Filbert had to... to cast a magic spell? Was that what he was doing? To get through? On the other side, Wes saw something that simply could not exist. A massive stone castle, whiter than the snow surrounding it. The towers topped with bright red roofs and every window filled with warm yellow light. As he stood, stunned, he noticed another man appear out of nowhere. Like Wes, the man was overweight, and like Wes, he was accompanied by a little person wearing a green outfit. But unlike Wes, he was Asian. More men started to appear, all around the same size and height, until there were ten in all, including Wes and ten little people. All of them stood silently, waiting. Wes saw one of them, a shaven-headed black man, try to get some information out of his little person, but the green-suited companion just shook his head. A few moments later, the portcullis at the front of the castle began to rise. Wes heard muffled factory noises and, on the edge of his ears, singing. Out of the spill of golden light emerged three more little people, two women and one man. Although where Filbert and the others wore green, these little people wore red outfits with white trim. The red-suited man stepped forward a bit. Welcome, he said, his voice gravelly. My name is Butternut Tickety, but you can call me Professor. Tickety? One of the fat men. He looked Indian, but Wes wasn't sure. Laughed out loud. Tickety? <laughs> I thought Mango was silly he said, speaking to his green-clad companion. But tickety, butternut tickety, this has to be a joke. The professor had pointed one finger at the Indian man, and his voice instantly went silent. That will be all, Pradeep, he said. Now, as I was saying, you may call me Professor. These ladies are Miss Pomegranate Glitterfall and Miss Truffle Advent. The three of us are charged with training and testing you. For what? asked the shaven-headed man. His companion gave him a sharp look, and he added, I mean, what are we being trained for, Professor? To replace him. The professor pointed upward, and Wes watched a sleigh, pulled by eight massive reindeer, streak across the sky. To replace Santa Claus. Wes and Pradeep were assigned a room together. They shook hands. I'm a graduate student at Punjab University, studying chemistry, he said. He was at least ten years younger than Wes, but they were about the same size. Wes knew he himself weighed about 350 pounds, give or take. What do you do? Graphic designer, Wes said. Do you have any idea what's going on or how this happened? Not a clue. Pradeep sat on one of the beds. It, it didn't so much as creak, which meant it was made for someone of his size. I received a strange one-word phone call, and then this little mango person showed up at my dormitory. He made me follow him to the common room. We went into the court closet, and, well, here I am. In my dream, uh, Filbert promised to answer an important question for me. Wes checked the closet on his side of the room. Warm red jackets, heavy pants, fur hats, and large black boots. I just had to say yes. So when I got a weird phone call, I said it. You had a dream as well? No. Oh, I mean, yeah. There was no television, but both of the room's desks sported state-of-the-art MacBooks. He wondered if UPS delivered up here, or if the little... People, the elves he supposed they were, actually made them. What did Mango say in yours? <clears throat> Pradeep snickered. I'm sorry, he said. I cannot get over the name Mango Terrific. <laughs> What's yours again? Filbert Gladness. Despite the silliness of the name, Wes felt a measure of pity for his companion. 
The professor had said each of them would be joined for their entire training by the elf who had brought them here. Wes knew all about being teased. Being fat all his life hadn't made for an easy childhood. But at least his name wasn't an object of derision. There just weren't that many good rhymes for it. Uh, about your dream? Uh, oh, yes. <laughs> Pradeep chuckled. My marriage was arranged when I was a boy, and it is scheduled after my graduation, which is soon. But she thinks I am unattractive because of my size, never minding the fact that I will be an excellent provider to her and our children. Mango said he would tell me why this is so. Wes opened the drawers in the nightstand between their beds. Nothing interesting in there, either. He looked out the window, which looked out on the flat plain surrounding the castle. It didn't open, and even if Wes wanted to escape, they were too high up for him to survive a jump. I was married, he said. Six years. Do you have children? Wes shook his head. She kept putting me off until I lost the weight, she said. But I've been fat all my life. I even had surgery, but that didn't work. How? I mean to say... Yeah, impossible. But it happened. I too have tried to lose weight, but since I was 20, I have been unable to go below 300 pounds. Either I am injured or something comes up to prevent me from dieting or exercising. Pradeep glanced at the door to their room, then lowered his voice. Are you Christian? I was when I was a kid. I am Hindu, Pradeep said. How can a Hindu replace your Santa Claus? <laughs> no idea. Wes stretched out on the bed, which was very comfortable, though narrower than the king size he had at home, and kicked off his shoes. You don't snore, do you? I don't think so. Good. Wes slipped his phone out of his pocket and checked it. No signal, which wasn't a surprise. But it was three in the morning for him, and he was tired. I'm going to take a nap. Uh, wake me up if something interesting happens. Wes, Pradeep, Filbert, and Mango sat at a wooden table in what Wes could only call a classroom. The professor stood at a lectern, while the ladies, Pomegranate and Truffle, sat at desks. Pomegranate, Wes decided, was rather cute with her hipster-like glasses and her red and white hat set cockeyed on her head. She chewed the end of her pen when she wasn't writing. Robin, he remembered, used to do that too. And it always used to gross him out. For some reason, Pomegranate's nibbling was endearing. He shook his head. Now was not the time to be distracted. The professor was explaining what was going on. Every ten years, he said, ten elves are sent into the world to bless ten newborn babies with the ability to someday become Santa Claus. This has been going on for centuries, since well before he was known in his current form. You'll find extensive histories in your laptop computers. Just a moment now, said a man with a Scottish accent. You're telling me one of your little buggers came and touched me when I was a wee baby. You're perverts! Calm yourself, Charlie, said Truffle. It's nothing like that. We merely slip in, wave our hands over your heads, and depart. No one knows we're there. And what's the point of this? The black man, Maurice, had his big hands and fists on his table. To make us all fat asses with no way to come back from it. Because let me tell you, man, the ladies, they don't love this. He pounded his stomach. A necessary precaution, said the professor. Your bodies must be ready to accept the spirit of Santa Claus. This happens every ten years? Wes asked. Every ten years, the current incarnation decides whether to continue in his role or abdicate and return to a normal life. This has happened, and come Christmas Eve, one of you will become the new Santa Claus. He glared at them, as if daring them to argue. The rest of you will go home as if nothing happened. We're stuck here for a year. Maurice slammed his fist on the table. This is bullshit, man. 
Truffle sighed and blew a kiss in Maurice's direction. He immediately relaxed, and a smile came over his face. Thank you, Miss Advent, the professor said. In the outside world, time will not pass for you. When your training is over, if you are not chosen, your companion elf will return you to the moment you left. You will retain no memory of your time spent with us, and you will go back to your normal life, as if nothing happened. Wes's opinion of the elves was revised dramatically upward. The whole thing was ridiculous, but he knew that, in the information age, if someone had spent a year living at the... the North Pole, he supposed, then the story would have gotten out. Unless the elves killed the other candidates. Thousands of people disappeared around the world every year, without a trace. Wes felt his head start racing, and then felt Filbert's hand on his arm. He looked down, and Filbert shook his head. Don't worry, he mouthed. That didn't help too much, but it was better than nothing. Also, the professor was saying, it isn't a year. Our magic can only shift time by two weeks. Here in the castle, the date is December 16th, even though you left your homes on the 25th. Think of this as a retreat. While you're here, you have all the talents and abilities of the actual Santa Claus. You will learn new skills, eat excellent food, and make new friends. And then have it all taken away, Pradeep said under his breath. The professor heard that. Yes, sadly, but it is the price you must pay for the opportunity to become one of the most beloved figures in the world. He looked around the room. Any other questions? No? Good. He clapped his hands. Miss Glitterfall will escort you to the dining room, and after you eat, we'll begin your training. Four. As Santa Claus, you will have five primary talents, Truffle said. Her voice was high-pitched and a little flat, like the doctor on that TLC show Robin used to watch. The simplest and yet most complex is this. She pointed to a bulging red sack on the table in front of the room. This is the bag you'll carry with you as you make your deliveries. Just reach in, think of what you want, and it'll be in your hand. She smiled. Just try not to think of anything heavier than you can carry. That's not one of your talents. How do we know what gifts to give? Asked Paolo, the shortest of the candidates, a bar owner living in New Mexico. Of all of them, he was the most Christmas spirited. He joked about his kids catching him playing Santa one year, and how much fun it would be to be the real thing for them. The professor will teach you that. My job is simply to show you how to get things out of the bag that you might need. Truffle talked for a few more minutes, then sent each pair to a work table. The task was to complete a cookie recipe. Wes and Pradeep got oatmeal raisin, and Wes wondered idly what Santa's favorite type was, because no one really liked oatmeal raisin. The bags were... Pre-programmed, Truffle called it, with all the necessary ingredients for all five different recipes and it was up to the teams to sort out the right ones and come up with a completed tray ready to be baked. Nicolo, a Russian prison guard, finished first. He admitted later that his father was a baker, followed by Paolo and then Wes. Are we getting scored on this somehow? Wes asked Truffle as they waited for the ovens to finish. Do our cookies have to taste good? That's just a bonus, she said. The goal isn't to finish faster, it's to get the right ingredients. Pomegranate will teach you about time dilation, so you have enough time to make all your deliveries. So if no one wins, said Koji, a sumo from Japan, then why do we compete? Truffle declined to answer. She only smiled enigmatically. The chimney room smelled of wood smoke. Not the gentle touch of it when someone nearby was burning leaves, but an overpowering odor that made Wes's eyes tear up. Twenty fireplaces, half lit and half not. And in the middle of the room, 
an elf named Leechy Lightheart. Leechy was almost colorless. Pale skin, white hair, light gray eyes. Even his red clothing seemed faded, and the white trim and piping was the color of dirty ice. His voice was soft as well, and everyone had a strain to hear him. Not that he had much to say. Visualize yourself at the top of the chimney. Step into the chimney. You will be at the top of the chimney. Not much of a lesson, said Gunther, a German air conditioning repairman who towered over all of them. You want to give us uh, maybe a little more, yes? Visualize yourself at the top of the chimney, Leechy said. Step into the chimney. You will be at the top of the chimney. He demonstrated, popping to the top and then back down. But that was all the help the elf seemed inclined to offer. Ach, the hell with it, Charlie said. He closed his eyes, stuck his foot into the nearest fire-free chimney, and waited for something to happen. His face went bright red when he realized he was still on ground level, one shoe in a drift of ashes. Each of the men chose a fireplace and did as Leechy said. Wes didn't have much luck. Not for a good hour or so. Not until Pradeep called down to him from up above. I did it! He said. When he came back down, he whispered to Wes. I saw the little bastard smirking at me. I think he's doing some sort of magic to stop the fireplaces from working. What? It was simple, Pradeep said. I did nothing different. What did it feel like? Leechy was suddenly beside Wes. Like this, he murmured, and shoved Wes into the fireplace. One crushing moment later, as if, well, as if his 350-pound bulk was squeezed into a narrow brick tube and sucked up to the top, like a lemon seed in a drinking straw. As if that he found himself standing on the little platform on the top of the chimney. Eventually, all of them managed to transport up and down with relative ease, if not comfort. Very good, Leechy said. Then he pointed to the other side of the room, where the fireplaces were lit and crackling. Now, do it with those. Wes was certain dinner had been sumptuous and decadent. He just couldn't remember it. Covered in soot from the fireplaces, feeling like he'd been stretched out and squished together far too many times, it was all he could do to get through the meal. Pradeep was in the same situation, and Wes was sure Mango and Filbert helped them make it to their rooms and get cleaned up. A good night's sleep helped, and a long, hot shower in the morning, and after breakfast, Wes and the other candidates arrived at the next appointed place. The room looked like every martial arts gym in every action film that had a training montage. And at the front was... Well, he was dressed in red and white, that was for sure. But instead of the standard elf uniform, the colors were blended together to form camouflage. Also, he was a man, not an elf. An actual human stood before them. Good morning, men, he said. Wes felt his spine try to straighten out of its usual slump. This man had the snap of command in his voice. My name is Watercress Dream, but you can call me Sergeant Cress. When no one did anything but shuffle their feet a bit, Cress raised his voice. I said, you can call me Sergeant Cress. Apparently, no one but Wes watched movies. Yes, Sergeant Cress, sir, he barked. Very good, Mr. Howard, Cress said. Step forward, please. Well, that certainly made Wes's ass tighten. He did as he was told, though. Yes, sir. Cress nodded, then pulled out a pistol and shot Wes three times in the chest. Wes felt the bullets hit, but they didn't hurt. When he touched his shirt, he found that he wasn't bleeding, and that there were no holes. Invulnerability, Cress said. Adults can't hurt you. They have trouble seeing you. And when you leave their houses, they start to forget you were ever there. Cress swung the gun in the direction of the other men. 
Some of them cringed, but Niccolo puffed out his chest, showing no fear. That's why an elf couldn't teach you this lesson. That's why I'm here. Sir, this was Pradeep, surely your name is not Watercress, uh, sir. No, Mr. Kodaji, it is not. Cress put his hands behind his back. I was Master Sergeant Warren Delfino, U.S. Marine Corps. How I got here is not important, but the elves adopted me as one of their own. They even gave me a name, which you will use while I am teaching you how to be invulnerable. Sergeant Chris, sir, Charlie said. If we're to be invulnerable, then what exactly can you teach us? Cress walked companionably up to Charlie, put his hand on the man's shoulder, and slammed his knee into Charlie's crotch. <sighs> Charlie gasped and jumped away, grabbing himself. But it was clear to everyone only moments later that it was nothing but a reflex. I can't hurt you, Mr. Duncan, but you have to learn how to act as if you can't be hurt. Sir? Wes asked. Mr. Howard? Sir, if we have all the powers that... <clears throat> Wes swallowed. That he has, then how will you remember what you've taught us? He paused. Uh, sir? That, Mr. Howard, is an excellent question. Cress resumed pacing. The answer is, normally I wouldn't. But you'll notice that your companions are watching this lesson. He waved his hand in a vague direction behind the men. West turned with the others and saw a little gallery, each chair holding one of the elf companions assigned to the candidates. They all wore satisfied expressions, especially Lemon Tinkles the unfortunately named elf assigned to Charlie, who had undoubtedly enjoyed seeing his charge get nutted by Cress. At the end of the lesson, they'll use their magic to make sure I remember each and every one of you. He stepped in Charlie's direction, and Charlie shrank back, unable to control it. Especially you. Then Cress smiled, a shark-like smile and Wes vowed to learn whatever Cress had to teach him as quickly as possible. After the morning with Cress, the candidates split into two groups and returned to either Truffle or, as Wes did, Leechy. The final two lessons were one-on-one, -on -one, and as the afternoon progressed, Wes watched companion elves appear, give their charges a little slip of paper, and then melt out of existence. It wasn't until four, when Wes was once again covered in soot and completely exhausted, that Filbert sent him to see Pomegranate. Hello, Wes, she said. Her voice was soft, and in the warm candlelit glow of her office, her dark hair seemed to move of its own accord. Or was that actually happening? Please, lie down. I am sorry about the... He gestured to his dirty clothes. She smiled and whispered something he couldn't make out. A tingle ran through him, and he realized he was clean again. Lie down. Wes stretched out on the cool, cushioned leather of Pomegranate's chaise. Close your eyes. He did. He heard Pomegranate's shoes click as she walked closer and then her cool fingertips on his temples. Wes started, but Pomegranate just chuckled. Relax, she said. I'm not going to hurt you. All right. Up close, she smelled like sweet candy and sharp spices. Or was that some kind of incense to relax him still further? What are we doing? No one... The massage was making him lose his focus and he fought to finish his sentence. No one came back after... after the class. They were probably exhausted. Wes felt her breath brush across his forehead. Why was she so close? He felt a pressure down below his stomach, one that he couldn't control, and he hoped she didn't see it. He hadn't been this close to a pretty girl of any size since Robin had left him. We're going to be here for quite a while. Okay with me, 
I'm going to teach you time dilation. Her voice took on a hypnotic quality, and that, plus the massage, plus the scent of her, let him float away. We'll stay here until you've learned how to slow time around you until you can move faster than you've ever moved before. Her hands slid over his cheeks, fingertips scratching the scruff he hadn't bothered to shave. You have to deliver all the gifts in a single night, after all. Uh-huh. His mouth felt like taffy. It was hard to speak, hard to think. Hard. Palm. Her name was so hard to say. So long. I can't. She shushed him. Just relax. She was massaging his shoulders now. He had never felt so calm, so cared for. They were, they were the only two people in the world. And she existed only for him. Relax and enjoy it. Wes woke the next morning completely refreshed, as if he'd slept for a week. And maybe he had. He didn't remember everything that had happened with Pomegranate, but he knew they'd been together for a long time, far more hours than there were in a day. She'd brought him to levels of relaxation that he hadn't thought possible. And then, as the knowledge had filled his mind, he'd reached for her, wanting her so badly, and... And what? What had happened? Each time he reached for the memory, he touched only gray mist. Good of you to join us, Pradeep said. Huh? Wes pushed off the covers and sat up. Someone had dressed him in pajamas. Maybe Filbert? I was the last one left with Leechy, Pradeep told him. He moved slowly, clearly still tired. If I never see that elf again, it will be too soon. But I thought you got all that, that you understood. I do. But then he moved the rest of us onto goat closets. Much, much worse. Pradeep took out clothes from his closet and started to change. Wes, as awake as he was and without the pain of a full afternoon of training, had a much easier time pulling on the red suit and black boots. How was it? How was what? Whatever you did with pomegranate. How was it? Wes wanted to tell Pradeep how good it had felt, how relaxed he had become, but for some reason he couldn't. You'll see, he said instead. Pradeep gave him a dirty look and stomped off to breakfast. Filbert appeared. Why couldn't I say anything? Wes asked the elf. Good morning to you, too. Good morning. Why? Everyone experiences pomegranates. Lessons differently, Filbert said. You have a crush on her, and she used it to teach you. How do you know? Filbert made a complicated motion with his hands, and Wes's bed made itself. Believe me, I know. Another twist, and the pajamas were warm, freshly laundered, and neatly folded at the foot of the bed. She won't let you act on it. Wes laughed. Just a little. What? <laughs> what, is she married or something? No. Filbert gestured toward the door and walked beside Wes as they headed to the dining room. But we've all been trying to climb that mountain. Pomegranate is... He thought about it for a moment. Well, she's a little funny in the head. There's hundreds of us here. She could have her choice of any elf she wanted, but she doesn't choose. She's always alone. Wes picked up on the bitterness in Filbert's tone. I'm sorry, he said, and meant it. Clearly, Filbert carried a substantial torch for the beautiful elf. If it'll make you feel better, I won't think about her that way, okay? I appreciate it. 
Filbert said, and it was the first time the elf had truly shown anything other than mere tolerance toward Wes. Now come on. You have to eat. And then you have to see the professor. Filbert's face was serious. Don't think about pomegranate while you're in there. Filbert told him. Does the professor have a crush too? No. Filbert said. The professor's her father. The professor's office wasn't nearly as warm and welcoming as pomegranates had been. Wes sat in a hard wooden chair across the desk from the senior elf, whose gray and black hair was swept back from a stern, authoritarian face. Telepathy isn't difficult, the professor said, hands folded on the desk. Once I show you how to do it, you'll have no trouble reading minds. But controlling it, that's the trick. What do you mean? Wes asked when it became clear the professor was done talking. Can't I just turn it on and off? You watch too much Star Trek, the elf said. Well, yes, Wes admitted. The professor sniffed derisively. Can you turn off your hearing? Your sense of smell or touch or taste? Wes shook his head. Of course you can't. And even with your eyes closed, you still see things in the blackness. Wes fought the urge to try it. Telepathy is a sense. You can't just turn it off. You have to actively not use it. All right, Wes said. I understand. Not yet you don't, the professor said. Because there are two kinds of control. The first is simply not reading minds. And that's the easy kind. What's the other? Not reading the entire mind. At Wes's confused expression, the professor continued. You have telepathy, so you know what people want, the gifts children desire, the things adults desperately need. When you arrive in a house, you should be able to instantly learn what you'll be taking out of your bag. But the human brain, it's like a library, and you only need one book in one section. And there's no computer or card catalog, just you and your control. The professor was right, West decided. That sounded difficult. What do I do? he asked. First, the professor said, you read my mind. How do I do that? And, Wes thought before he could stop himself, do I really want to? Let me show you. An instant later, Wes felt something tingle inside his skull, an itch he couldn't scratch. It didn't hurt, but Wes found himself thinking about his surgery. He couldn't stop the memories flooding his head. The months of preparation, the long recovery, the sick realization that it wasn't working, that he wasn't losing the weight. He wanted so badly not to be fat anymore. He wanted something to work. He wanted... He wanted... He stared at the professor, throat tight. Santa can't give you that gift, the elf said, not unkindly. The magic that makes you a candidate precludes it. Wes couldn't speak. He didn't want to speak. He only wanted this to be over. The next time the professor entered his mind, he vowed to be ready. Unfortunately for Wes, it wasn't that easy. Wes didn't bother going to lunch that day. Instead, he took the stairs as far down as they went, eventually locating a storage room. He sat on a box, put his head in his hands, and started to cry. When he looked up, he saw Filbert sitting on a box as well, a couple of yards away. He sniffed and scrubbed at his eyes. How... he swallowed. How long have you been there? Long enough. Filbert said. So, the professor showed you what you wanted most, huh? It wasn't really a question. I went through hell to try to lose this weight, Wes said. It was hard to speak, but he fought through it. I dieted, I exercised, I took medicines that made me feel like shit, I got half my stomach cut out, and for what? He glared at the elf. For what, huh? 
just to find out that I had no choice. He swept an arm around the storage room. To someday maybe end up in Santa Claus's frickin' castle at the North Pole. To maybe be chosen to replace him. It's not worth it. Wes. It's not worth it! He shouted, jumping to his feet. God, Filbert, if you knew what it was like, trying and trying, making myself miserable, wanting to change... Wes trailed off. He leaned his head against the rough stone wall. I just don't want to be like this anymore. I'll do anything to not be like this anymore. I blame technology, Filbert said. Wes turned to face him. What? How old do you think I am? He stared blankly at the elf. Wes, I'm almost 400 years old. I've been working with candidates for most of my adult life. Being fat, up until recently, it's been acceptable. Not, you know, ideal. Not for everyone. But if diet and exercise and maybe medication didn't work, people just accepted it. Even a hundred years ago, I don't think I would have simply accepted it, Wes said. Fair enough. Filbert's face was serious. New technology, new advances in medicine, and now people who can't lose weight the old-fashioned way are getting their stomachs cut out. Who does that? I mean, sure, piercings, tattoos, whatever, but body modification on that scale is dangerous. I know it's dangerous, Wes spat. Do you know how long I spend in counseling, with people trying to convince me this could kill me? If the surgery didn't, then vitamin deficiencies might, unless I was careful for the rest of my life. He hadn't questioned it when each of his meals had been accompanied by the exact cocktail of pills he needed to take. He was sure the elves wouldn't have wanted to kill a man who could be their next boss. I made changes to my life that no man should have to make, Wes continued. It was still hard to talk about, and he still saw red when he thought about what he'd gone through, and for nothing. For nothing, he said aloud. I did all of it. For nothing. But you could become the most beloved figure in the entire world. Pfft, I have no desire to be Justin Bieber or a sparkly vampire. Wes plunked himself down on his box. I want my wife back. I want my stomach back. I want to be normal. Is that so wrong? No. Filbert said. No, it's not wrong. A pause. But this is who you are. You have to accept it. Bullshit, Wes said. I don't have to accept anything. What can you do? To that question, Wes had no answer. Five. Wes found Santa Claus in the stables, running some sort of brush over one of the eight massive reindeer that lived there. Prancer can smell you, he said. You might as well come in. He edged his way around the corner and, for the first time in his life, came face to face with Santa Claus. The man wasn't very impressive. Sure, he was large and round, with white hair and a thick beard, and Wes was fairly certain that if he had the balls to poke Santa's stomach, it would shake like a bowl full of jelly. But dressed only in a white undershirt and work pants, and the omnipresent black boots, Wes couldn't imagine him as the very image of Christmas. Well, don't just stand there, Santa said, his voice deep and rich. Grab a brush. I'm sorry, sir. I, I don't know. Oh, don't call me sir. Santa said. It's just the two of us. My name's Bill. Bill? William C. Birch. He wiped his hand on his pants and held it out. His grip was strong and hearty. Feeling miserable? How did you... Bill, Santa, tapped his head. I can read minds, remember? Oh, right. Wes took the brush Bill offered and watched for a moment, then started working on Prancer's shoulder. The reindeer snorted and made a noise low in its throat. What? He likes it, Bill said. They like it when Santa takes care of them, instead of making the elves do it. Why do you do it? Bill shrugged. 
I've always liked animals. I had a farm back in my day. Horses, cows, the whole mess. He brushed for a moment. I wish they'd let me have a dog. I miss dogs. You're Santa Claus, Wes said. Can't you do what you want? Nope. Bill moved closer to Prancer's hindquarters, brushing his massive thigh. The brown fur, Wes had found, was quite smooth on top, but thick underneath. I'm just a delivery man. Wes found this hard to believe. Bill laughed. <laughs> Come on, he's about done. Let's move on. The next stall, Bill said, contained the only female in the bunch, Vixen. She was paler in color, but only a little smaller than Prancer. And yes, I just deliver the gifts. But uh, I thought you were in charge up here. In charge? <laughs> Bill laughed again. Not the ho-ho-ho of Santa Claus, but a big, booming laugh like Wes thought he might hear at a bar or a football game. He decided that, were this not the North Pole, he and Bill might be friends. Thanks, Bill said. And Wes remembered, too late, that Santa could read minds. It's the elves, really, who are in charge, he continued. Professor Tickety, he's the leader. Yeah, I kind of got that. Wes and Bill were on either side of the reindeer. Wes found it therapeutic to actually do some real work and decided that if he became the next Santa, he would groom the animals himself. Why don't they deliver the gifts? They tried, Bill said. It turns out that magical little people are scary, not heartwarming. So they appropriated my namesake, St. Nicholas, and spent centuries building Santa Claus up to what I am today. He paused. And to answer your next question, no. I don't know why they do it. Are they even human? Or, or, like, native to this planet? Who knows? Bill said. Maybe they are, and maybe they're not. But I've been here more than twenty years, and I've never once seen them steal a child, or hurt a human, or try to cause havoc and mayhem. Maybe they're from Earth, or maybe they're from an alternate dimension, I don't know. I wish I did. Maybe then I'd know why I'm stuck like this. Like what? Wes opened his mouth, then closed it again. It'd be a lot faster if you just read my mind. Fair enough, Bill said. Wes felt the itching inside his head again and tried to ignore it as he brushed Vixen. Several seconds later, Bill came around the reindeer and put his hand on Wes's shoulder. I'm sorry, Wes. It's not your fault. He shrugged. It kind of is. If I hadn't told the professor I wanted to retire... I'd still be fat, Wes said. The elves told us they picked the kids at birth. Whether they needed us or not. They changed us. You could be Santa for another fifty years, and by then I'd be old and fat instead of young and fat. I guess you're right. Bill gestured towards the stall entrance. Come with me. I think you need a drink. You pull that out of my brain? I didn't have to. Come on. Six. No one said anything to Wes about the afternoon he spent with Bill drinking and talking. Wes brought Bill up to date on what was happening in the world, and Bill tried to tell Wes that everything would be all right in the end. Wes had also asked about the fabled Mrs. Claus. But when Bill's face had gone still and his eyes had missed it over, he quickly changed the subject. For the next week, Wes did the best he could with his training. He didn't see Bill again. He guessed the elves had had a word with him. He also didn't have any more lessons with pomegranate. But that was all right, because it had only taken the one afternoon to learn time dilation. He slept more soundly and longer than he'd ever done before. And when the lessons with Leechy or Cress got too boring, he asked to use the restroom and, once alone, sped himself up to get it over with. The professor stood at the head of the dining table and told them a decision was coming. We've observed your progress throughout the training, he said. And the new Santa Claus will be announced tomorrow night. He will join the current incarnation on Christmas Eve for a practical lesson. 
and on New Year's, we will send the old Santa back into the world. What happens to him? asked Paolo. He'll be about 60 when he goes back, Truffle said. He won't retain any memory of who he was, but we'll provide him with a home and enough money to live out his retirement in comfort. A live-in nurse will help him remember who he's supposed to be. To Wes, that sounded a little cold. Better for Bill to just throw himself off the top of the castle than suffer through textbook amnesia. And that will happen to us if we are chosen? Niccolo crossed his arms over his chest. Why would we want to become Santa Claus if this is the case? Being Santa Claus is the reward, Truffle said. You aren't working toward retirement. That isn't the goal. It is my goal, Niccolo said. Maybe it is, the professor allowed. But after ten years of being Santa Claus, perhaps you'll change your mind. What if we don't want to retire? Excuse me? Wes leaned forward in his chair. What if we want to stay Santa forever? What then? You may stay in the role as long as you like, Pomegranate said, smiling. It would certainly save us having to train another group of candidates. Okay, sure, Wes said, but let's say you pick me and, and I say I'm going to want to be Santa forever. Are you still going to... He swallowed hard. Are you still going to pick random babies to turn into fat men like us for no reason? We have no choice. The professor's brows drew downward. You can promise to keep the role, but if you should someday wish to retire, we need a contingency plan. Wes felt that familiar itch inside his head and he immediately shut up. In his brain, as loud as he could, he began singing the first song that came to mind. Unfortunately, it was Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. He had no idea why, but to his surprise, the professor went a little pale and sat down hard in his chair. Interesting. The itch came back, and Wes told his brain to start singing again. Anything to keep the professor out of his head. The final training sessions were with Truffle and Cress. Wes was pretty good with the bag, but it was Cress's lessons where he really excelled. After being beat up in school all those times for being fat and smart, it was a refreshing change to stand there, let Cress berate him, and take every punch the man could throw at him. But he hadn't expected Cress's low blow. Not a literal one. By now, even Charlie didn't flinch when Cress went for the nuts. No, this was something else. This was Cress saying that Wes's wife had been right to leave him, had been right to move on to someone who wasn't a fat, pathetic slob. That had been too much, and when Cress had come in for another punch, Wes had swung on him with all his might. The punch connected. Wes felt it all the way up to his shoulder. Cress flew across the room to smash into the stone wall. Filbert teleported himself to the floor of the classroom, grabbed Wes by the wrist, and teleported them back to the room Wes shared with Pradeep. What the hell was that? The elf snapped. What are you doing? He can say what he wants to me, Wes growled. But no one talks about Robin. No one. I don't mean why, Filbert said, shoving Wes backward until he was sitting on the bed. I mean, you could have killed him. What? Wes felt himself slump. How? Cress is human, Filbert said, starting to pace. He gnawed at his thumbnail, clearly worried. You have all the power of Santa Claus. Wes shook out his hand, which still ached. It was healing, though. No adult could harm Santa Claus. And Wes, for all intents and purposes, was Santa Claus. I'm not apologizing, Wes said. I don't care if you apologize or not. Filbert cursed in some strange language. His thumbnail was bleeding deep violet and he wiped it on his vest. I... I just hope you didn't kill him. K kill Wes stammered. I mean, how? You punched him thirty feet across the room! Filbert shouted. He cracked the wall with his damn head! Wes didn't say anything. He couldn't. I'll be right back. Filbert said. Stay here. 
Wes didn't know where he might go, but Filbert looked mad enough that he decided he'd better listen. It wasn't Filbert who came to collect Wes, though. It was Pomegranate. Is he all right? He'll live, she said. He's pretty surprised, though. No one's ever hit him before. Pomegranate sat beside Wes and took his hand. How are you? I'm fine. Wes let out a long breath. <sighs> I was really worried that I killed him. She shook her head. There were nine elves in the room. I'm pretty sure that wouldn't have happened. She stroked the back of his hand, where his knuckles would have been bruised if he wasn't, well, who he was. The professor told me to speed you up. Get you to tomorrow night when we send everyone back. All right, Wes said. That was quick. Pomegranate actually looked surprised. How can you not be disappointed? I don't really want to be Santa Claus, he said. I just want to be normal. So the current incarnation told us. Bill? Told you? She had the decency to look embarrassed. Well, not told. Not really. But the professor has ways of knowing things. Wes's mouth was flooded with an acid anger at the senior elf. That was a private conversation. He didn't have the right... He's in charge, Pomegranate said. Her voice was softer than ever. He chooses Santa Claus. He rules the castle. I'm surprised you thought anything around here was private. Wes felt his face flush with shame. He'd taken a couple of very long showers while he was here, and he really, really, really hoped the professor hadn't looked in on that. He swallowed. Look, I'm sorry it happened, but he deserved it. No one talks about my wife like that. You're not married anymore. No, I'm not. He felt tears prick his eyes and blinked them away. Look... Can I just get out of here? Of course. She slipped off the bed and waved two fingers in a circle. Wes's few belongings arranged themselves on the bed. The clothes he'd arrived in, his snuggie, his phone. Get changed, and then we'll bring you back. Seven. After Wes got dressed, Pomegranate moved him forward in time to the next evening. Filbert was waiting for him. Let's go, he said. He sounded defeated. Follow me. What's wrong? Filbert shook his head. How do you think that punch reflected upon me? What? Another shake. I'm off training detail. I bring you back, and then I'm in the factory making useless crap for overprivileged little brats that don't deserve it. They walked in silence for a moment. I'm sorry, Filbert. If I'd known... If you'd known, you probably would have done it anyway. And honestly, I don't really blame you. Cress went too far. The professor's going to have a talk with him. Good. Wes had a thought. So, who won? Won? Santa Claus. Who's the new Santa Claus? Oh. They turned into the main hall toward the courtyard and the waiting portcullis. Gunther. Gunther? Wes couldn't really see the no-nonsense repairman delivering presents to little children. But then, he couldn't imagine any of the others doing it either. Not Pradeep with his snarky remarks. Not Niccolo, who didn't want to do it anyway. And definitely not Koji, the quiet, introspective sumo. Maybe Maurice, who'd really taken to the idea, although Wes couldn't imagine a black Santa either. Maybe taking the role changed the way a person looked. Not that it mattered now. I hope he enjoys it. He was pleased, Filbert said. He didn't have much of a family, and the professor generally arranges things with them anyway. Tragic accident, etc. That seems kind of cruel. Filbert shrugged. It's worked for hundreds of years. Yeah, but there's technology now, and... Filbert rounded on him. Look, I'm not going to debate this with you. 
You don't want to be Santa, you don't give a damn about any of this, so why don't you just shut your mouth and be glad it's not you? Wes shut his mouth. Wes's coat closet still smelled like, as Filbert had put it, mothballs and wet ass. He pushed the closet door open and the two of them stepped out into the foyer. You want anything to drink before you head back? Filbert shrugged. I could use a beer. Don't they have that at the North Pole? Wes asked as he headed for the kitchen. No, we have our own liquor, but I like beer. Okay, then. Wes took a youngling out of the fridge and handed it to the elf. So, how does this work? Filbert drew a sigil in the air, and the time appeared. 5.56. At six o'clock local time, a memory extraction team will show up. You'll lie down in bed, and when you wake up, you'll remember nothing but a good night's sleep. Seems simple enough. It is. Filbert wiped the clock out of the air and drank some of his beer. I, I miss this. You can take the rest with you if you want. Really? Sure. Wes pulled the six-pack, a five-pack now, out of the refrigerator and set it on the coffee table in front of Filbert. It's the least I can do. Filbert took another sip. Look, Wes, I'm sorry, too. I was hard on you in the beginning, and I probably could have been more supportive. Were the other elves? I mean, Mango wasn't all that great to Pradeep, and Lemon Tinkles is an asshole. He is, isn't he? <laughs> Filbert chuckled. The last time we did this was 1981, by your calendar. It was so much easier back then. Now everything is so... complicated. Technology, medical procedures, commercialism. It's all so much more. He drained the beer and set the empty bottle on the table. <sighs> I guess after all these years, an elf can get a little jaded. I guess. I mean, TV shows bore me after a couple of seasons. Used to drive Robin nuts. We don't have TV at the North Pole, Filbert said. He took another beer. Do you mind? They're yours now. Thanks. A couple of minutes passed. Three elves stepped out of the coat closet, all of them wearing black versions of Filbert's green outfit. Filbert put down his beer and nodded to Wes. It's time. All right. Wes went into his bedroom, followed by the four elves. He slipped off his shoes and stretched out on the rumpled sheets. Hey, Filbert. Yeah? He grinned. Nice knowing you. Filbert stepped back and let the other three elves take up positions around Wes's bed. They raised their hands. And Wes's phone rang. Oh, one second, guys. Uh, this might be work. I, I need to get it. The elf at the foot of the bed gave Filbert a glare, but Filbert shook his head. Wes took that as a scent and slid his finger across the screen. Hello, this is Wes Howard. Wes! Who is this? He glanced at the screen. An international call. Suddenly he recognized the voice. Pradeep. Wes and Pradeep had exchanged phone numbers in their first morning on the North Pole, not knowing they'd have their memories erased. They put the numbers into their phones and then forgotten about it. Uh, this is Wes Howard, he said, trying to remain calm. How can I help you? They don't just erase memories. <sighs> Pradeep was gasping, as if he'd been running. They're going to kill you. What? I don't understand you. Filbert was staring at Wes rather oddly. Wes shrugged at him. Uh, international client. On Christmas? Wes shrugged again. Then, into the phone, he said, Tell me what's happening, and I'll see what I can do. Are they... Are they there? Yes. You, you have to fight them! His voice suddenly became breathy and soft, as if he was hiding somewhere. Don't let them kill you, Wes. Don't let them... <laughs> His words were cut off by a choked gurgle, and then the sound of the open line faded. Wes stared at the phone. Call dropped, he said, trying to keep his voice level. Weird. May we continue? Asked the lead elf. Wes looked at Filbert. Will it hurt? I don't know. I've never had it done. Can we get on with it? The lead elf had a sharp, waspish tone to his voice. I guess so. Wes took a deep breath. 
and dilated time. Wes didn't know how long he had until the elves realized he'd made a break for it. He jammed his feet back into his sneakers, shoved his phone into his pocket, and ran for the living room. As quickly as possible, he scooped up his wallet, yanked the spare charger out of the wall, and pulled open the door to his coat closet. That was when Wes felt the time dilation fall away. Three black-clad elves stood in his living room. Where was Filbert? And raised their hands. A purple nimbus started to appear. Wes jumped to one side, reached into his gym bag, which still hung in the closet. He concentrated. Help me fight them. I just want to escape. Something fell into his hand. Something heavy and wooden. A baseball bat. Good enough. Wes took three quick steps toward the elves and swung. Two of them got out of the way, but the bat smashed the arm of the third. Wes heard bone break and the elf's face went pale as he stumbled. Wes kicked out at him, hit him in the chest, and the elf's head smacked the coffee table as he went down. <laughs> Wes winced. That was more than he'd been bargaining for. But if Pradeep had been right, they weren't going to just delete his memory. They were going to kill him. Wes wheeled, saw another elf, swung at him. He ducked, and when Wes overbalanced, the elf kicked him in the back of the knee. Wes stumbled forward, saw the third elf with that purple nimbus around his hands, and brought the bat down like an axe. It cracked the elf right in the forehead, right before he was crushed under Wes's heavy bulk. Two down. But it was too late. Wes was too slow, and the other elf was bearing down on him, purple glowing brighter and brighter. Wes brought his hand up, covered his eyes, and tried to think of something to save himself. He couldn't. He was going to die. Wes steeled himself and waited for the inevitable. It didn't come. Why? Filbert shouted. Wes opened his eyes and struggled up on his elbows. Why did you try to kill him? Filbert snarled. He had both hands on the last elf's shoulders, holding him in place. Blue-white magic crackled where they touched. Answer me! Erasing their memories. The black-clad elf growled. Doesn't always work. Sometimes... Sometimes they remember. So you kill them? Yes. The professor orders it and we obey. Why not just wipe our memories again? Wes asked as he got to his feet. The elf glared at him. We tried that centuries ago. This is the only way to keep her secret. No. Filbert said, his voice soft. No, this is wrong. It is our way. It's wrong! He shouted. I can't let you kill him! You don't have a choice. The black-clad elf closed his eyes and Filbert jumped backwards as if shocked. The blue magic became deep purple and the elf turned to Filbert. I have my orders. The elf threw the magic at Filbert, but Filbert teleported himself to Wes, shoving him toward the coat closet. It was just in time. The black-clad elf threw another purple bolt at Filbert, who waved his arm. The blast crackled off a blue-white shield. Get out of here, you idiot! Filbert's face was pale with the strain. What about you? Don't worry about me. Just go. But what if they kill you? Filbert spared Wes a smile. Then they kill me. But you're a good man, Wes Howard. You don't deserve to die. His face went hard and he shrank back as the other elf hurled bolt after bolt of purple magic at his shield. But you will if you don't get the hell out of here. Wes stepped into the coat closet. I'll never forget this. Filbert nodded. Neither will I. Wes shouldered his gym bag and concentrated. The magic of Santa Claus bore him away before he could see if Filbert survived. Epilogue Wes stepped out of the second floor janitor's closet at the La Quinta Inn in Snohomish, Washington. He'd stayed there once, a couple of years ago, and last June, with the professor's elves hot on his heels, it had been the first place he'd thought of when he needed to escape. For now, it was his home. He'd bought a room in cash. The bag was surprisingly recalcitrant when it came to untraceable credit cards or actual money, but people were still willing to pay top dollar for rare baseball cards, and the bag knew all about those. Plus, he'd taken all the money the thieves at Jimmy's house had had on them, about 500 all told, and that meant at least three more nights. 
Wes pulled off the mask and then his damp clothes. Fighting crime always made him sweat, but it was worth it. He imagined Jimmy's expression when he opened the Xbox game and smiled. The next morning, after cereal and coffee, Wes used the hotel's business center to check the news. One of the local stations down in Portland had a story about a robbery gone very wrong for the burglars. The story linked to a national piece about real-life superheroes, and Wes read that too. He was quite surprised to find himself mentioned about halfway down. While many of these so-called superheroes are merely men and women out to exact justice when, as they put it, the system fails, some have a more enigmatic approach. Take, for example, the recent rash of foiled robberies along the West Coast. According to police reports, a man reportedly enters the house through the fireplace, subdues the criminals, and then leaves the same way. He has yet to reveal his name, but some in the vigilante community have taken to calling him the Secret Santa. Secret Santa, Wes said aloud. He liked the sound of that. And now, a word about today's story. Hi, it's Josh Roseman, author of Secret Santa. The very first thought I had that led to Secret Santa was a fat guy fighting Santa's elves, but the story became something much, much more. I am not a small guy. I qualify for weight reduction surgery, but my insurance policy has a blanket exclusion against it. That means that no matter what the doctors say, insurance will never pay for it. When I found out about that, I was furious. Fortunately, as a writer, I have a healthier method for expressing my feelings than many other folks I know. So I made the hero of my story a guy who'd had the surgery, and it failed. And now he's angrier than ever. And in comes Filbert to tell him he might be the next Santa Claus, which eventually leads to him discovering that even if he doesn't, he'll still be fat forever. No wonder Wes is so mad. When I heard the premise for the 2011-2012 Broken Mirror event, I used that as my impetus to get the story written, edited, and submitted in six weeks. I didn't expect it to be quite as long as the finished product, but one thing I like about the Doonstief is that as long as the story is what the editors consider good, they'll publish it regardless of length. An interesting note on Wes, he originally appeared in an unfinished story of mine called A Hero Sits, about a guy who kept being in the right place at the right time to save the day, but because of his issues with food and some badly timed stomach aches, ended up in the bathroom instead of on the scene. So, that's the story of Secret Santa. I do have a sequel in mind. Maybe I'll write it for the next Broken Mirror event. Depends upon the prompt. Thanks to the Dune Steve's editors and judges for their high opinion of the piece. Thanks to the producers and actors who put their time into this 12,000 word adventure. And thanks to you for listening to it. Bye now. Twelve thousand? We'd almost buy our own ship for that. That's right, but who are you going to get to fly it? Uh, anyways, yes, welcome back, folks. I hope you enjoyed the story and the uh, author's note. As far as that goes, we also had a very enterprising young co-host on our show had extra questions that he asked our Broken Mirror Story author. So I figured now would probably be a good time to read those off as well. Would you like to do that? Or yeah, I thought that it would be interesting to ask all of the people who won the contest the same questions. As we've mentioned before, we open it up for the authors to have their note to say whatever they want. We've had people talk for like seven or eight minutes. And they can say whatever they want, but I always have questions and I think, dang, I wish he and his author's note had answered this. So in this one, I just thought it would be fun to ask them all these questions, okay? So I will I will be us and you can be him, okay? Just read his response. Okay, that sounds good. And maybe on the next one, we will make the author record the answers and we'll pretend that it's an actual interview. <laughs> okay, so question one, uh, how much of this story came from the prompt Rish and Big gave, and how much came from a previous story or idea you had thought of in the past? As we were coming closer to the BMSE, I was thinking about the kind of story I wanted to write. I sort of had an idea for the next Santa Claus, but I hadn't fleshed it out yet. 
Plus, the prompt was announced close to the holidays, and I thought it would be funny for an atheist raised culturally Jewish to write a Christmas story. And I wanted to include the scenes where the elves fight the fat guy. That had to be in there. Don't you love how natural I sound when I'm, when I'm reading a script for somebody else? I sounded like I was really Josh Roseman, didn't I? Uh, Roseman! I, I, it's funny, I thought that he was there with you. <laughs> All right, next question, sir. Uh, question two, how did you decide what the single word spoken over the phone would be? Did you start with that word and go from there, or did you have to shoehorn the phone call into the story as you were going along? I started writing not knowing when the call would come, but the idea of Wes getting a call that told him he would be the next Santa was always my idea for what the call would be. The story was originally substantially longer before we got to that point, and I think it was more organic in its longer form. I hope the call doesn't feel too shoehorned in there. Wait, the story was longer than the version we're reading we just read? <laughs> Substantially, apparently. Uh, last question. You are a champion, my friend. How confident were you in entering the contest that you would be one of the winners? Did you have a feeling while writing it, when it was done, before writing it? Ever. <laughs> My victory in the inaugural BMSE was my first paid fiction sale, and for that I will always be grateful. I was confident of that story, and I was confident the readers would like Secret Santa as well. I was less sanguine about A Dog and His Boy, my entry from last year. My concern was that it would be too long and would possibly lose points because of that reason. With Secret Santa, I had a feeling during the editing process that it was a good story. However, I tend to write long. Sometimes it's hard to sell those. I'm glad there are markets like the Doonstie who are willing to publish longer stories like this one. All right. Well, hey, thank you, uh, phony Josh, for talking <laughs> to me here. You're welcome. Of course, we want to thank Amory Lowe for producing this. And you didn't say so before the story, I don't believe. But yeah, it was mother long, <laughs> even with whatever editing Josh did. And for Amory to get it done for the holidays in time for Christmas, that's commendable. Yeah, he did it pretty darn quick. I am uh, definitely impressed with that. And I think it turned out really good, really listenable and interesting and fun. Even as long as it was, it didn't feel too long to me. You know what I mean? So that's always a plus. I don't know. That's good. Uh, we also need to thank Julie Hoberson, Renee Chambliss, and Abby Hilton for doing the lines of the girls. Well, let me see. We've got a cast list here, actually. Let me see if I can find that. Okay. Okay. So here's the cast list. For the most part, Rish and I did the majority of the voices. I wonder if people had trouble with knowing that that was us or not. Makes me curious. Starting out the story, there was the boy whose name was Jimmy. That was played by Rish. The cop was played by Big Ankelovich. That would be me. And Wes's therapist was played by Abby Hilton. The various elves. Leechy was played by Big Ankelovich. Filbert played by Rish Outfield, doing his Willow Offgood impersonation. How dare you? Pomegranate was played by Julie Hoverson. Professor Butternut was played by Big Anklevich. Butternut Tickety. Uh, <laughs> Truffle was played by Renee Chambliss. The head of the Elf Kill Squad was played by Amory Lowe. He takes all the good roles. <laughs> Sergeant Cress, who wasn't actually an elf, but we put him on the elf list because he was in Santa's area, was played by Rish Outfield. Then there were the various Santas. Wes, who was played by Big Anklevich. Charlie, who was played by Rish. Gunter, who was played by Big. Pradeep, who was played by Rish. Maurice, played by Rish. Koji by Rish. Nikolai was played by Rish. Paolo was played by Big Anklevich. And then... The real Santa Claus, or the present incarnation of Santa Claus, was played by Rish Outfield. So there's your cast list. It's a lot of the same names. Now, hey, that's not Amory's fault. We knew because we had very little time to get it in 
that the more stuff we recorded at the same time, that very first recording session, which ended up taking two whole nights, the faster it would be to edit it together. In my opinion, and you may have a different one, and I'd like to hear it, the hardest thing about producing a story is getting all the voices together. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, once you get them all there, then it's uh, much easier. Sometimes it's hard to even get started until you have them all, um, depending on how things go. Yeah, it, it's tough, especially with something like this. What I mean, you saw the mountain. You heard, I should say, the mountain of character names that I just read off there. It's a lot of characters. And if we had somebody different for every single one of those... Yeah, it, this would be next year's Christmas episode. We wouldn't even get all the voices together until at least July. And yeah, like you said, I hope that doesn't bother people. But it was to save time. And what we usually do is we'll record, if one of us is the narrator, we'll usually record the whole story from beginning to end as sort of a temp track with the female voices and all that stuff. And whoever is producing can remove our stuff, but they have the base there of where our lines are and how they're supposed to be in the pace. And yeah, we had a guy that used to produce for us, that used to do voices for us, that just barely emailed and he's back in the world again. And he said, hey, I'd be interested in doing that stuff again. And had he said so in October instead of in December, I'm sure we could have gotten him to be a couple of those voices. It's just uh, we had a deadline. And so, yeah, it's sorry. It's kind of a big and rich extravaganza tonight. Yeah, hopefully it didn't come across as lame. I thought that some of the voices turned out really cool and different and unusual. It's interesting because Amory, when he finished this story, he sent us out an email and he said that editing the elf voices was the most fun that he's ever had editing. He said thanks for giving him the chance to do that, which... You know, after editing a 12,000 word story, saying thanks for giving me the chance to do that seems like the last thing you'd be saying, but she's like, Jill burn in hell for giving me that chance. But yeah, he said that it was a, a load of fun. He said the voice that you did for Filbert was the most hilarious sounding voice, at least to him, he says. He, he Hearing you cursing and stuff after putting your voice into that high pitched uh, willow off good thing. Just cracked him up. Although, how much cursing did you do? I know you said Mizrakta. There was one point. <laughs> there was one point where you're supposed to curse in some kind of a foreign language that whatever the elves speak originally, and you're like, oh, okay, well, Mizrakta. <laughs> Although I don't think you can hear it in the final version. But yeah, he was also talking about the voices, and he said that for Renee's lines, he barely had to change the pitch. On her voice at all. Because she sounds so young. And <laughs> yeah, she already has kind of a high-pitched elf-like voice, I guess. He only had to pitch it up like 5%. Whereas you and me and uh, Amory's voice had to go all the way up like 15% to get elfy sounding quality to it. Yeah, that. And he also said he was going to do the voice for Watercress. Whatever. I can't remember his full name. But C Sergeant Cress. He was going to do that voice, but he enjoyed your performance of it so good that he just he couldn't take it out. Which is funny because I think sometimes you've confessed that uh, since we always do that scratch track that we record where we do all the voices, sometimes you're sad to take your performance and cut it out and put in somebody else's lines because you're like, wow, I think I did better on that one. Well, there's <laughs> something to be said for being in the moment and reading the whole story in context. Sometimes when you do voices for somebody else's show, you don't know the whole story. You only know your lines. and you don't. Oh, yeah, that's totally true. So there's there's that. But also, uh, you know, I'm an egomaniac and I feel like I've <laughs> earned all the Parsec Awards I've gotten. That you have. You seriously have earned those. So way to go. <laughs> but the, the playing with the pitch on that stuff is really cool. And I hope that that enhanced the story and made it more real and, and, and all that. And, and of course, this isn't exactly an audio drama. And so I don't know how much better it would be, in your opinion. If we had had, let's say, seven other male voices instead of ours? Yeah, I don't know. I guess that's something people can talk about in the comments. Again, you and I are perfectionists when it comes to our own work and with the show as well. And if we had started this episode in, let's say, August instead of when we started it, would the story have come off as better? 
or or would it be about the same? And 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 that's a question I don't think we can answer. Lots of times, a deadline actually helps something just because you have to focus and work on it. And you and I both know what it's like, where you're just like, oh, well, sometime I'll get it done, and you and and then you never do. Right. I don't know if it would make it better to have other voices. It would make it different. I don't know if that means better. I guess you would have more variations in the voice of the various characters. Again, does that make it better? It's hard to say. I guess you and I tend to think that that does make it better. It makes it more understandable, maybe. It keeps you from getting confused as to which character is which. But it doesn't necessarily mean that it makes it better. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the story. You and I both, well, I, I, I don't know what your voting was like. But I think you and I discussed this when we were reading the stories, and this was high on both of our lists of, you know, I said, uh -huh. oh, what stories did you like? And I named off, and then I said, oh, and the Santa one, and you said the same. Yeah, I said that one that Big Inkovich wrote, I gave a terrible score to, but the Santa one, <laughs> I really liked that one. No, no, yeah, I totally did. It was up pretty high. We were talking uh, the last time we got together about this story. I think it was, it was probably when we read it. Come to think of that was probably the last time that we actually physically got together instead of having to do this over Skype like we are today. Yeah, it's been a nightmare. <laughs> I donate an incredible amount to the show and we'll just quit our jobs and do this, okay? And then, and then there'll be more episodes. Yeah, there you go. It'll be an episode like pff, once every week to 10 days or something. <laughs> Deal. Definitely. <laughs> but I think we were walking around and we were talking about this story. You were saying that a f mutual friend of ours has a contact with like a comic book publishing company. I don't know which one it is and, and it doesn't really matter, but that he was trying to sell ideas for the comic book company. And I was saying that, oh man, this Secret Santa story that we're reading would be perfect for something like that. It just seems like, and Josh mentioned in his author's note that maybe he'll do a sequel to it. it seems like this is set up to be an episodic kind of a thing. Like you could do a new episode of the adventures of the secret Santa. Um, every Christmas. Yeah, you could do it every Christmas. I, I see as far as that goes, I don't know how that would work because you know, a, I don't work in publishing of comic books. Like if there was something that was Christmas themed, how would they do it? Would there just be a regular sized issue once a year at Christmas time? Or would they do a mini series every December where an issue came out once a week or what kind of a thing? I mean, you who've read lots of comic books, what kind of publishing schedule could you imagine for something like this? They'd probably just have it be like an annual where it's a, a, a giant sized issue every December. That would be cool, though, I think, like a giant-sized man thing of Secret Santa comes out every December and you have more adventures. Because, I mean, it seems like there's so much that could be set up in this original story here. If you turn this into issue one, you have Pomegranate, who our Secret Santa has a crush on. So you've got sort of an, a love interest of sorts or whatever there. You have Filbert who was his previous teacher, who didn't know that they try and kill the Santas at the end. And so now, Filbert, what is his loyalties? Where do they lie? Is he going to come over to Secret Santa's side and help him learn more, help him learn more powerful magic and stuff? And then there's Professor Tickety, you know, and the other elves that can always be on Secret Santa's trail. And, you know, you'd have several times where Santa has to fight or Secret Santa, I should say, has to fight the elves off. I, I, I really like that kind of dynamic where, you know, you have a guy who's out there trying to do good, and then there's the government or, the you know, whatever, the cops. It's kind of like Spider-Man being the vigilante, and the cops are always trying to get him. And I guess in this case, there would be more than that, because I'm sure the cops would also try and get the Secret Santa guy for being a vigilante, on top of the fact that he's also always running from... The Elf Kill Squad. I don't know. It just seems really interesting, don't you think? And maybe sometime down the road, there could be a face-off with Sergeant Cress. Maybe you could run into some of the other Santas that also trained, and they managed to escape too. Or it just seems like it's, it's really rife with possibilities. 
to where you could really make an interesting annual comic book that would go with this. And I can even see the uh, costume, you know, you have a kind of a black Santa outfit. And I even thought of what would be a cool emblem, you know, how every superhero has their little emblem on their chest. You could have kind of like a Christmas tree ornament shape to your emblem and then a little SS in the middle of it. <laughs> I just think it would be cool. I don't know. Now, also in his author's note, he mentioned that he had to cut this thing down. So who knows? There may be a whole novel series in this. And every year he can put out a book. There you go. Uh, about the next chapter or, you know, each one takes place the next year, like a Harry Potter kind of thing. Yeah, that's what he said, that he had to cut it down considerably. I think it was there was a, a great deal of lead up to the phone call where he goes and starts getting trained. I think it's a lot of having his surgery and being bitter about it is my guess as to what was there and what he cut out. 12,000 words. I don't know how many words of that he cut out, if it was 16 or 20 or what it was before. It, it definitely has potential. I, another thing I wanted to ask you about was uh, the twist. Is that something that you saw coming? That the elves kill Santa Claus? Or... Oh, yeah, that there's going to be a sinister turn in this story. You know, I didn't see that at all. Even though he hints at it at one point. I didn't pick up on that until the second time through. Yeah. Early on, he says something like, oh, but what, the only way they could do that is if they killed them or something like that. And you had that suddenly like, huh? But yeah, I didn't pick up on it until I think you and I were reading it for the recording. We both said, oh, whoa. Yeah, that's always when you know that your foreshadowing was good and subtle enough is when it is missed by people and they find it on the second reading. Or maybe that means it's not good enough. I don't know. I'm not really a writer, so I don't get how these things are done. Okay. <laughs> I, I See, I was enjoying the story, and Christmas stories tend to be, well, for the most part, they tend to be really tame. Right. You know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take it a step further and say they tend to be bland and predictable because it's supposed to be a cozy, familiar, non-threatening holiday fair. And I sort of felt like that's where this is going to go. And then when everything took a dark turn, I mean, and you know, I mean, he, the, the character of Wes was miserable and unhappy and angry. And that you don't tend to get a lot in a, a Christmas story. Right. But then when, yeah, there's, there's suddenly dark forces of violence and stuff that are coming. It blew me away. And to me, it elevated the story to the next level. Of just, you know, oh, I'm enjoying this is a nice Christmas story to dang, holy cow, that, you know, that really rocked. And so uh, without it, I probably would have still liked the story, but not liked it as much as I did. Yeah, I'll have to agree. There was, I mean, it is a 12,000 word story. And there were points when I read it the first time around where I thought, you know, this is a little long. They probably could have done without this scene or that scene or, but I think with the ending that you got, it kind of made those things pay off or something. You know, you, you see, oh, Secret Santa now has all these skills and you know the skills a little better and uh, you're able to see him as a superhero doing good with the powers of Santa Claus. And yeah, there's no way Wes wouldn't be chosen normally in a story or a movie or a TV special. Of course, you focus on the guy who's going to be the new Santa. You don't focus on one of the runners up. Right. And so that, again, was not predictable to me at all, that he would, uh, he, he washed out. He didn't get picked as the big guy, no pun intended. And, and, and yeah, he went home. It just, to me, that was really another thing that elevated it, that it could surprise me. Because, you know, you and I have read a lot of stories. Okay, you have read a lot of stories. I just... Laid there. I just, I did. And, <laughs> and for something to just grab me and say, wow, I had no idea it was going to go in that direction. That's commendable. Yeah, I think it, it worked out. There's a reason why this story made it to the top vote getter list. I think it got more than one 10 out of 10 score from uh, the various voters that we had judging these stories and we didn't mention this before when we were talking uh before the story started how the judging for the broken mirror story event went how it was conducted we had our submissions editor nicole 
What she did was she removed the author's name from all the stories and sent them out to the various readers. So nobody who was reading the stories knew who wrote what story, so they couldn't read and go, oh, oh, Josh Roseman, he's the guy that wrote 27 Jennifers, I like that guy, and have their judgment tainted. And even in, in the case with my story, you know, they couldn't go, oh, good, it's Big Anklevich, he's the host, I like that guy, I'll give him a one. Wait, wait, what? So, <laughs> Because, yeah, my name was not on there for me to get that extra point and, and get a two out of it. Instead, um, all, all the judging was untainted by any of that kind of stuff. And it's all was merit based on just the story itself. You know, if the story won, it was because the story was liked. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that's something we hadn't mentioned before. No, but I'm sure we'll have to mention it again. And again. And again, because there's still three more stories to go. Are there really? Yes. That's one thing we should mention. They won't They won't be in order of vote getting, you know, who was best, worst, etc. And they also won't be one after the other. There will probably be other non-Broken Mirror stories mixed in between the Broken Mirror story winners. Just to let you know. Yeah, there's not really any way we can do them in order right now, just because we're in over our heads. <laughs> All right, so I think that's probably what we've got to say about the story. And now it's time to talk about something completely different. Hello, this is Incredible Hulk. I'm here to talk today about gamma radiation sickness. <sighs> Many years ago, me get smashed by gamma rays. Me not die... But now, whenever I get angry or outraged, a startling metamorphosis occurs. Me get very big, very strong, very green, and very... strong. But not everyone getting gamma radiation end up as lucky as Hulk. My friend Doc Sampson get green hair and really, really small genitals. My cousin Jennifer get tall, way prettier, and big lady bubbles. My enemy Samuel Stearns get big brain and become enormous asshole, and depending on who draw him, his head like gigantic green scrotum. Many others lose hair, or lose life, or turn into giant monster with four toes and gills on head. Hulk named spokesman for Gamma Sickness Foundation in attempt to raise money for research and treatment for those suffering from this problem. Hulk urge you to donate to this podcast as announcer man has promised a portion will go to the eradication of gamma radiation problems. Believe me, Hulk's sick of new bad guys to fight. We appreciate donations. So if you can, click on PayPal button. If you not donate, Hulk may smash you like puny Spider-Man on his birthday. Thank you. This is why you don't have a Parsec Award, Rish. Okay, so there's a couple of things that we wanted to mention before we go. First of all, just the other day, I got an email from Dave Thompson. Who is Dave Thompson, you might ask? So is I, who, who is Dave Thompson? It turns out Dave Thompson is <laughs> the editor of Podcastle, uh, another podcast that's not on our network but uh, we're still friendly with the folks over at Podcastle. And every now and then they ask us to read a story for them on their show. And we're always happy to oblige because we love those. We love Dave Thompson. Those folks over there. We love Dave Thompson and we love the stories and stuff that they do over there. So we're happy to help them out. A few years ago, Rish got to do their Christmas story, which was called The Christmas Mummy. It was by Tim Pratt and Heather Shaw. Well, two years later, lo and behold, again, this time I was asked to read the Tim Pratt, Heather Shaw Christmas story. This year it's called Catching the Spirit. And uh, yeah, it should be up uh, by now over on their site. So you can just pop on over and give it a listen and uh, enjoy it. And you know, Tim Pratt is a, one of my favorite writers. 
of all time. And I remember, and we've talked about it, I'm sure, several times, the story Impossible Dreams that the two of us both loved beyond all reason um, when it appeared on Escape Pod. And it kind of made us fans of Tim Pratt from ev- forevermore. And so anytime we get a chance to read a Tim Pratt story, that's an awesome opportunity. I was stoked to be able to do that. And uh, yeah, hopefully you like it. But yeah, head over and check it out. It's kind of like a bonus Dune Steve Christmas story because we were involved in it and it's Christmassy. Uh, basically, the story is told uh, by someone Christmas related who is tired of all of the uh, commercialism and selfishness and awfulness of people around the holidays. And so he casts off his his ability to give Christmas spirit out into the world. And it starts to go from person to person like a plague. The spirit of generosity, of giving, of selflessness. And uh, it's funny because... A lot of people view it as some kind of contagion of a madness that moves from person to person. And we have to insulate ourselves from this crazy uh, disease, this this red and white plague. And so it it gives a couple of scenarios of people, you know, being affected by this uh, virus. And then, uh, you know, we find out how it happened and why. And uh, anyway, you do a bunch of characters on there and uh, it's it's amusing. And it's disturbing, and it's also, you know, all Christmassy. Yeah, so uh, give it a listen. Check it out. I think you'll enjoy it. And if you haven't listened to The Christmas Mummy, which was a story from two years ago, you should check that out, too. I think you can find that on the Podcastle site. I suppose I'll I'll link to that one as well. So you guys can just go to the show notes and, and head over and listen to the stories that we've done. If you haven't heard The Christmas Mummy... You should check that one out, too. You, you can hear Rish's lisping eight-year-old boy voice. That's a good one. Everyone loved that. That really brought in the... No, uh, not everyone. The applauds, the laudits of the crowd. <laughs> yeah, it's cool when people ask us to help them out, and uh, I'm, I'm sure a bunch of people will hear your voice that would normally not. Right. Okay, so another thing coming up here really soon. Um, a few months ago, Rish and I were asked to be a part of a panel at the Bi Mon Sci Fi Con. The what? Actually that's from The Simpsons. Um, we were asked to be panelists at the New Media Expo, which is it's a convention that's for people who are creating stuff. Non traditional markets, right? Yeah, I, I, that's a good way to say it. It's it's like for bloggers, for podcasters, for YouTube video makers, that kind of stuff. It's a way to learn more about the craft that you're making as well as ways to like monetize your thing that you're making and so on and so forth. They wanted to have more stuff in the podcasting track that was about the art of making these things as opposed to the business of making these things. So they invited Abby Hilton. She's going to be on our panel. She's the one that's the moderator and the one that kind of put it together. Rish and I will be on the panel. John Miro, who did a story on our show just a couple weeks ago. Weeks? Uh, Okay, like a couple months ago now, I suppose it's probably been. But it's only been like two episodes ago. (laughs) The story was Harlan's Wake from episode 135, if you recall. Let's see, who else was on the panel? Also on the panel is L. Scribe Harris, who has done various voices on our show, as well as all over the place. And then I think Abby even invited a bunch of other people. I mean, she was going to have the panel to end all panels, and then she found out that there was only room on stage for a certain number of people, and she's like, oh, crap, I already invited all these people. And some of them have said yes, and they said, oh, well, there's a space open for another panel right after yours, so why don't we just have a second panel? So now there's going to be a second panel, and Renee Chambliss is in charge of that panel, and she's getting together a host of folk. And I know that Marsha Latham is included in that group, as well as several other folks. Gallagher Larby? Um, No, I don't think Larby Gallagher is going to be on that yet, but maybe next year. What is the topic of our panel? Um, Abby said that the title of the panel would be Using Comedy to Humanize Characters and Hook Listeners in Audio Fiction. Yikes. 
<laughs> We're going to be talking about comedy, which it's something that we feel we have a little bit of knowledge about. I don't know. We hate to come off as pompous asses and say, that, oh yeah, we know all about comedy, so we're not going to, but I think some people listen to the show because they think it's funny. Not only do we do funny stories, but sometimes we do funny skits and funny conversations as well. So, Big Anklevich, you're my hero. Anyways, we're going to be there talking about that. I'm not sure what Renee's panel is on, but I think it has something to do with voice acting and making your characters more interesting by way of that. So this event takes place January 6th through the 8th in Las Vegas, Nevada. So if you're interested in going to check this out, you want to meet the dudes from the Dune Steve as well as like half of the people who have ever done voices on the show, maybe you're considering getting into podcasting and you want to learn how to do it, yeah, you can go and check that out. It's a cool thing to learn about that kind of stuff. Yes, we'll do our best to amuse people on the panel, and I will try not to hog the spotlight because it's Abby's panel, um, but you'll probably see me make an ass of myself because I do do that. <laughs> it's a defense mechanism, and I think that's something we would talk about. The cool thing is you'll be able to see him do that instead mm. of just hear him do that like usual. And if the past has been any indication, that's a mistake. But oh well. <laughs> I figured we'd all hang out and we'd watch Renee's panel and then whoever wanted to get together, we would try and do a reading, a, a recording of an episode where, you know, full cast like we always do and just record it. And then eventually we'll put it out and it can be an episode as well. Right. Yeah. It's one of those things that we're planning to try and do. Now, did, did people say that they would do that or was that just something we were spitballing? Yeah, I think pretty much everybody wants to do that. Some people have mentioned it to me aside from me mentioning it to them. You know, they came to me with the same idea first. So I think it's definitely something that will happen. I don't know who all is going to participate in it, but we'll at least have several people that are willing to. We may have to bring actually several stories and do uh, more than just one to make it work. Which I'm fine with. Wouldn't it be great if suddenly we had three stories in the bag that we could put in in 2013 so it didn't become like 2012 was with huge gaps in between episodes? <laughs> that would be very cool, yes. Another thing that I was thinking that we probably ought to do while we we're there is have some kind of a Dune Steve get together for, you know, maybe you're not going to the New Media Expo itself, but you're somewhere in the area. Like Des Moines. Right, Des Moines, or maybe you live in Tahoe. Well, Tahoe is probably not very close to Las Vegas, is it? What's a, what's a close city but not? Well, maybe you live in L.A. and you only have a couple hour drive and you think it would be worth it to come all the way out and meet the uh, Dune Steve guys for that. Or maybe, you know, you live in the middle of the Nevada desert <gasps> and you want to come over to Las Vegas and meet the Dune Steve guys. I thought it might be cool to just pick a night during that week where we just get together at some establishment and hang out at a table and have some dinner and talk and get to know each other. Karaoke bar. Oh, good idea. So anyways, we'll have to figure that out because it's not something we've set in stone yet. And, and we'll, I guess, type up an entry and put it on the blog and put it onto the uh, website. So check that around the time of January 4th or 5th or maybe even the 6th. And we'll have the announcements so that you can all come and hang out with us if you're interested. So you already said what time the panel was? I don't know what time the panel is, to tell you the truth. You'd have to get that info from the uh, the New Media Expo. And you know what? We've never done one of these before. And if this works out well, maybe we'll do another one and maybe it'll be more in your uh, neck of the woods. But according to my notes, it's Tuesday, January 8th from 3.15 to 4.15 p.m. Oh, wow. You have notes? I'm impressed. That's way more organized than even I. And I'm supposed to be the smart one on the Dune, Steve. I must have missed that meeting <laughs> where they decided that. Somebody called me that once, you know that? Uh, so there. <laughs> yeah, somebody once called me Rich, too. More than once. That's pretty much your second name. Okay, well, hey, then that's that's all we got to say about that, right? <laughs> right. Okay, so this is probably our last episode of the year. I really highly doubt that there's going to be any possibility of us getting another one in. Although you never know, because when Christmas finally comes, then I will have some time off. 
Up until the night before, I work every single day, including Sundays. Since it's most likely that we won't have another episode, I figured it would probably be a good time to give a shout out to everybody and say thanks to everybody who has helped us out this year. We, we talk about how it's been hard and how long the space between episodes has gotten. And without the help that we've gotten from everybody this year, it would be infinitely more space between episodes. But we've have, we have lots of friends out there who have volunteered their time to produce stories for us, to read lines for us, to read stories for us and tell us whether they're ones that we should be checking out and deciding on whether they should be in our lineup or not. You know, we've had Nicole, our submissions editor, and, and our various uh, Oompa Loompas who have been uh, reading for us the submissions that we have. You know, the host of producers and voice actors that we have that help us out. And seriously, like, at the, it's at the drop of a hat. Like, we talked about Amory, you know, we gave him not enough time to get a 12,000 word story put together, and yet he did it. You know, if it was given to me, it would have taken at least a month, probably three months longer than he took. So it's amazing the effort and the help that we get. And so we just wanted to say thank you to everybody who uh, has done that for us. Yes, definitely. You know, I enjoy doing the podcast, but I've been so busy the last month or so. that You know, there have been a couple of times that I could have come over at like 11 o'clock at night. And I just couldn't do it. But it's because we have fans, it's because the people tell us that they appreciate the show, that we keep trying to do it. I mean, it's 1.09 a.m. right now, and you and I just got off work. And yeah, we, we're, we're really doing it because of, of you guys. And I just finished yawning as you said that, too. Okay, you're still holding your baby, too, right? That's right. Yeah, I'm holding him to keep him asleep because he kept crying. He's sick right now, and so he keeps coughing himself awake. But if I hold him, then, oh, he, he'll sleep like a baby. Well, the second I put him down, he awakes like a demon. <laughs> so, yeah, those are some of the things that we get to deal with. But with the help of others things still manage to happen and that's really cool and, I, and I'm glad that we're able to continue going because I don't want to see it go away. I know that lots of people enjoy it and so you know we'll, we'll keep going as long as we possibly can for sure. And since this is the Broken Mirror Story episode, we probably also ought to especially thank all the people who volunteered to read and evaluate the Broken Mirror entries. We had a good 12 or 13 or more people that volunteered to read these stories. And you had to read them all. You weren't allowed to just read some of them. So thanks a lot to those folks who helped us out with that. I know it's been a while now since you guys finished reading those stories. But uh, yeah, the stories are finally coming out. And uh, thank you very much for your help with that. All right. That's good. Um, I guess we could talk about the end of the year. We could talk about the end of the world. We could talk about the holidays. But uh, well, we've been talking a long time. We wanted to keep this one short and look at the time. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to keep this one short since the story itself is as long as a whole episode usually tends to be. So, yeah, we'll go ahead and, and cut it off right now before it gets too long. All right. So thanks for listening, folks. If you <laughs> most likely this one came out so late that you couldn't get to it before Christmas. So we hope you had a happy holiday. If you're actually listening to it before Christmas, we hope you have. You will have a happy holiday coming up. At the very least, have a happy new year. That's right. And you know what? In the new year, our next episode, I promise we will try to have an amusing little sketch in our next episode. All right? Yeah, that sounds good. Maybe we can talk about some uh, goals for the new year, huh? Hell no. <laughs> Come on. Why not? Oh, because it's just See what I did to realize there? you've accomplished none of them. Oh, yeah. Wow. <laughs> All right. Thanks for listening, folks. Yes, I've been Rich Outfield. And I'm Big Anklevich. Your mountain is waiting, so get on your way. Okay. Season, <laughs> season's greetings. <laughs> Don't be silly. Adrian, Adrian Peterson. Peterson.
The Dune Steef is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license, so you can share the show with whomever you'd like, but you cannot charge for it or alter the show. See you later, everybody. Take two. Adrian Peterson's having a good year, man. He's like at 1,800 yards. He's, he's close to breaking the single season uh, rushing record. If he keeps it up, he may well beat that. I don't care. I think I may have even, I think Starship Sofa. Ooh, you. I don't think you could hear that. Could you?